Okay, so this is going to be a continuation of um, the first part of the previous lecture, which discussed some of the major transitions um, of early life um, that occurred in early Earth history and kind of um, worked up to the, the beginning of where uh, life actually started to exist on Earth. So in continuation of that, we'll move into more of the um, different eons and periods of time throughout Earth's history, um, moving in extension from the early creation of Earth and early creation of life. Now, the whole period of time um, regarding life on Earth, um, that whole historic period, um, is roughly three galactic years in length. Uh, one galactic year uh, is equivalent to about 225 to 250 million Earth years. So we're talking about a very um, expansive period of time. Um, the actual history of, of Earth can kind of be divided into two major categories. You're Pre-Cambrian life and then Cambrian life. Um, so we'll start with the pre-Cambrian life. Um, the pre-Cambrian life or pre-Cambrian um, time period. It's actually a, a super eon, as I'll soon discuss. Um, this occurred between 4.6 billion years ago um, and lasted to about 542 million years ago. Um, the beginning part of, of that period uh, was predominated by prokaryotes. They ruled for about one to two billion years. Um, and then that was followed by the evolution of eukaryotes or eukaryotic organisms, uh, which took place about uh, a little over two billion years ago. Um, so that originally was uh, the kind of the origin and evolution of single-celled eukaryotes, and that was then followed by the evolution of multicellular um, eukaryotes. So kind of going into this um, time period a bit deeper, uh, pre-Cambrian time period is, is referred to as a super eon um, because it encompass such a large amount of time over Earth's history. Um, and it's composed of three separate eons. Um, you have the um, Hadean, Archaean, and uh, Proterozoic. Now each is, is kind of a, a flawed representation as far as the amount of time that each um, encompassed. Um, these three um, eons were the large, kind of the three largest geologic time segments in Earth history. Um, together, they comprise 90% of Earth's history. So again, they uh, take in this enormous uh, period of, of historic time, um, which is why the Precambrian period or Precambrian time is known as a, a super eon rather than just a regular eon. So the Hadean Eon, um, this was really when Earth was forming. So it, it occurred after the formation of the solar system. Um, this was the time before there was actually a solid surface on Earth. So Earth was still coalescing and condensing into solid matter. Um, you had the formation of the moon, the formation of the magnetic field around Earth, and um, the um, internal core. So this was more of the kind of the building stage of Earth itself. Um, the Archaean Eon followed. Um, this was when life began. So the oldest known fossils and rocks originate in this Eon. Um, it began with the formation of the first solid rocks um, and also led to the, the creation of the first continents. 
um, these continents uh, were not the continents that exist today. Right? They were very different in shape and distribution, but they were formed at this time. Um, also had the arisal of the prokaryotic life, which um, led to the uh, production and accumulation of oxygen. Um, so when they, they evolved kind of late in um, this eon, um, they began pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. Um, but again, when I talked about in the, the first lecture, that original oxygen wasn't free oxygen, right? Those photosynthetic organisms were producing oxygen, but it was reacting immediately with dissolved iron in water. Um, and that was creating these banded iron formations um, that we have used to uh, serve as evidence that this occurred. Um, once the iron was fully oxidized um, out of the oceans, you were able to have the accumulation of free oxygen in both the oceans and the atmosphere. And that created this great oxygenation event where you shifted from an anaerobic atmosphere to aerobic atmosphere because of the presence of now free oxygen. So that shifts into the Proterozoic Eon. Um, the Proterozoic Eon uh, spans about 2.5 billion years ago to 542 million years ago. Um, and it's marked by the major accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, that led to this mass extinction event um, where you had large declinations of anaerobic organisms and the proliferation of aerobic organisms. And kind of stemming from that event or arising out of that event um, was the origin and evolution of the first eukaryotic life. And that occurred about uh, 2 billion years ago. Um, and again, those, those first eukaryotes were single-celled eukaryotes. Um, and over time in that Proterozoic Eon, they evolved into multicellular organisms. Um, in the kind of the mid region of this period uh, was something known as Snowball Earth. And we'll get into this a little deeper, but um, essentially what happened is, again, there was this proliferation of photosynthetic organisms once you had the oxygenation of the, the atmosphere. Um, and because you had such proliferation of these organisms, they started to actually take out too much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and by removing mass amounts of carbon dioxide, it caused um, the poles to cool, uh, which created extra ice cover. And this put into motion um, something called an ice albedo feedback, which caused global uh, cooling of the Earth's surface kind of at this unprecedented scale. It essentially turned the Earth into a giant snowball. Um, albedo uh, refers to um, a measure of Earth's reflectance. So this is the amount of sunlight or radiation that's being reflected back into space. Right? So a higher albedo means that the Earth is reflecting more sunlight back into space rather than trapping it as heat. So as you increase albedo, you increase the amount of cooling that's occurring on the planet. Albedo is a cooling effect. Um, whereas if you decrease an albedo effect, you allow for increased heating. Um, so we'll get into that more in a moment. Um, but also at the, the end of this period was ozone stabilization. Um, so Jed, in response to the last lecture, you had um, expressed how you found it very interesting that at the beginning of time, there was no ozone layer to really protect organisms and life on Earth from um, ultraviolet radiation. 
Now, the reason why there was no ozone before this, this period was because there was no oxygen. Um, stratospheric ozone is formed naturally by chemical reactions that involve solar ultraviolet radiation, or your sunlight, and oxygen molecules, and kind of in a very short, condensed version of what happens, um, solar ultraviolet radiation will break apart um, an oxygen molecule, so a molecule of O2, to produce two oxygen ions. So you have two O1s per se. And then they will come together to form um, O3, which is ozone. Um, so you can only have the production of ozone if you have oxygen present in the atmosphere, which is then broken down into individual um, oxygen ions that can then react to form O3. Um, so once oxygen was present in the environment, you could have the creation of that ozone layer and the stabilization of ozone in the, the, um, the stratosphere. And that's uh, still today is what protects, protects life on Earth from ultraviolet radiation. So ozone in the stratosphere is good. It's ozone in the upper layers of the atmosphere, like your lithosphere, that's, that are worrisome. All right, so Snowball Earth, getting a little more in depth with this. Um, Snowball Earth describes a theory that for millions of years, the Earth was basically entirely or almost entirely covered in ice. And these um, regions of ice and uh, glaciation stretch from the poles to the tropics or tropic regions, right, the, the equator. Um, and that expansion of ice and, and glaciation was catalyzed by, again, this ice albedo feedback. Um, this was a, a positive feedback, to be more specific. Um, feedback loops can either be positive or negative in nature. Um, positive feedback loops are referring to cycles that self-amplify over time. So you have a series of reactions that create a product that catalyzes that reaction to continue occurring um, or catalyzes the creation of more products that allow for the continuation and augmentation of that cycle. So that's what fueled this. Um, the ice Albedo feedback, um, again, it's a positive feedback. Um, what happened was when you had proliferation of these photosynthetic organisms, they took too much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which allowed the atmosphere to cool. And as a result, more ice formed at the poles. Now, ice serves as a great medium or a, a, a great albedo surface, right? It's a great surface for reflection. And, um, you know, the major talk about or the importance of the polar ice caps is that they allow for this high reflection of solar radiation back into space. So as more ice was created, more solar radiation was being reflected back into the atmosphere. So more ice you had an increased albedo, which means you increased the cooling of the atmosphere. So by increasing the cooling of the atmosphere, you further increased ice production, which further increased the albedo, which further cooled the planet. So again, you get this, you see how it kind of self amplifies. So that feedback was what enabled this expansion of um, of the, the glaciation between the poles and the, and the tropics. Um, now this freezing happened over 700 to uh, 650 million of years ago. Um, and it's kind of the best explanation that exists 
um, for why glacial deposits are present at um, tropical latitudes. Um, the topic or the um, actual mechanism itself is, is somewhat controversial. Um, it's debated as to whether this was a full on um, snowball event per se, or if there was um, more than one kind of uh, glaciation event um, that were uh, variable in duration and extent um, that led to this ultimate global glaciation. It's also um, uh, controversial whether this was truly global in nature, but no matter what the the issue is or where you, um, that controversy lies, that the end product is still the same, right? So no matter what, massive glaciations occurred during this, this period. Um, this period is also known as the cryogenian or cryogenic period, meaning freezing. Um, and it was composed of, of two glaciation events. Um, you actually had the, the Sturtian glaciation along with the Marioan uh, glaciation, which happened right after it. And those are the greatest ice ages um, known to have occurred on Earth. So just as you had the formation of Snowball Earth, you had the undoing of Snowball Earth, right? All good things come to an end. Um, again, you had the, the formation of, of uh, Snowball Earth because um, uh, the removal of CO2 and the, the creation of this ice albedo positive feedback. So at the end of the Proterozoic Eon, the Earth was frozen solid. Um, once the Earth was frozen, carbon dioxide was no longer able to be utilized for photosynthesis, uh, which caused kind of a halt in the CO2, uh, CO2 cycle um, in your early oceans. Um, so the rate of CO2 consumption plummeted, but the rate of emissions or the amount of emissions remained the same, right? Carbon dioxide was still being emitted into oceans and atmospheres um, via these uh, subsea volcanoes and uh, hydrothermal vents, um, as well as terrestrial subglacial volcanoes. So CO2 was still being pumped into the oceans and the atmosphere, but it wasn't being consumed. So as a result, it began to accumulate in the oceans and the atmosphere. Um, so this slow buildup of atmospheric carbon dioxide, um, again, occurred because of an imbalance between uh, outgassing and consumption, outgassing referring to the production and emission of um, carbon dioxide from these volcanoes, um, whether they were subsea or terrestrial. Um, now, as carbon dioxide built up, there was um, an increase in what's known as the radiative holding um, due to the greenhouse effect. Um, this is essentially referring to the amount of solar radiation that is um, contained um, within the Earth and not reflected back into space. Um, so radiative holding refers to heating potential, right? So solar radiation that is um, absorbed by the Earth and not reflected back allows for heating. So Eventually, this um, CO2 radiative, uh, sorry, radiative holding um, eventually kind of displaced or outcompeted the radiative loss by reflective surfaces or your planetary albedo effect. Um, so once that happened, temperatures started to warm, right? You had mass warming, which caused um, an increase in uh, ice melting. And at that point, you reverse the feedback. So before 
you had the creation of Snowball Earth by this ice albedo. You can kind of think of it as a, a forward ice albedo feedback. The That Snowball Earth was then melted or undone by a reverse ice albedo feedback. Um, so what happened here was as atmospheric temperatures warm because of an increase or accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, you had the melting of ice. And <clears throat> this means you had a greater amount of um, open water areas that were exposed. Um, open waters or areas of exposed water act as um, absorptive surfaces. So they absorb solar radiation, whereas ice reflects radiation. So open water is a warming mechanism. So as temperatures in the atmosphere increase, you increase ice melt, which means you increase these areas of open water that are exposed, which absorb radiation and therefore works to further increase the temperature or warm the temperature of the oceans and the atmosphere, um, which by warming the atmosphere further increases the amount of ice that's melt, melts, which further increases the amount of open water that's exposed, which therefore increases the amount of radiation that's absorbed. And now you see it, you get this reverse ice albedo, albedo positive feedback. So before it was working forward to create more ice, now it's working in reverse to um, decrease the amount of ice that's present by warming the climate. So you had this feedback that basically drove this massive meltdown of snowball earth. Um, climate models actually suggest that this meltdown was very rapid. It, it could have occurred in as little as 2000 years. So with this event, you had um, massive or, or uh, rapid sea level rise, um, which caused continental flooding. Um, and by doing so, you had the, the creation of these uh, shallow intertidal zones that would uh, come to serve as these open niches and environments for um, evolution of multicellular organisms. Um, so the, the meltdown took very little time um, to occur, but um, as far as kind of going back to a, a stable atmospheric carbon dioxide level, that would take tens of thousands of years. So that, that occurred far after this, this period. Uh, it wasn't until more of like the Silurian and um, Devonian um, eras where you actually had the, the stabilization of the atmosphere um, where um, you had the kind of balancing of the carbon dioxide cycle. Um, I mean, you had a balancing of the amount of CO2 that was pulled from the, the atmosphere and released into the atmosphere. And that balance enabled kind of this uh, stabilization of the greenhouse effect and therefore stabilization of the atmosphere. All right, so that was Snowball Earth. Snowball Earth ends um, and that end or the end of this, uh, Snowball Earth, the end of the cryogenian period um, is or was followed by multicellular life or the appearance of multicellular life. Um, there were two major developments of multicellular life on Earth. Um, the first uh, development was not very successful. It only lasted uh, for a few million years. The second developmental period uh, was far more successful, and that led to the evolution of present day multicellular life forms, as well as all modern day body plants. 
Um, so this first developmental um, period or segment um, occurred very, very late in the Proterozoic um, eon, kind of right at the, the end of that eon. Um, and there's a time period that's now called the Ediacaran. Um, it only lasted from about 635 to 542 million years ago. Um, so again, it wasn't long lasting in the, the scope of the entire history of, of life on Earth. Um, now, multicellular life appeared at this time um, because at the, at the end of Snowball Earth, you had um, kind of the, uh, not proliferation, but redevelopment um, and re-expansion of photosynthetic organisms and activity. Um, but the melting of glaciers also washed in these massive amounts of pulverized rock and minerals into the oceans. And that served a these wonderful kind of footholds um, that photosynthetic organisms could adhere to, colonize, and then start photosynthesizing on. So you had another um, kind of heavy round of photosynthetic activity start to take, take place. Now the rising O2 levels um, that were occurring, this allowed single-celled organisms to start using excess um, oxygen to build um, collagen and also kind of glue themselves together. And that was the start of, or the beginning of multicellular life. Um, these multicellular organisms obviously had advantages over single-celled um, eukaryotes. Um, by kind of gluing themselves together or fusing together, um, they could uh, either um, collaborate as far as their cells. So the cells of those organisms could work together for certain tasks, um, or the cells could begin to differentiate and take over specific tasks. So by kind of adhering together and collaborating, um, these originally single-celled organisms um, could become... Uh, specialized and therefore have uh, selective advantages. So that's kind of what allowed for the selection of multicellularity versus single-celled organisms. All right, so let's talk about some of the biota of this period. Um, biota refers to the total collection of organisms um, in or of a geographic region or time period. Um, so again, the Ediacarian period marks that first appearance of multicellular life forms. Um, now the actual fossil record of animals for this era is, is very sparse. Um, and it's thought that such is due to the fact that these organisms hadn't yet evolved hard shells. They were, they were soft bodied organisms um, hard shells make for much more robust fossils. Um, but what has been found shows a very diverse and um, enigmatic assemblage of organisms. Um, many of these creatures were very unusual in their structure, and many belong to extinct phyla. Um, the major subkingdom um, for this period, as far as um, the fauna were uh, eumatozoa. So these were Cnidaria, um, Thetanophora, and Bilateria. Um, and again, many of the fossils that were found and are of soft bodied animals and uh, trace fossils as well. So these were different burrows um, that existed in the this uh, sedimentary layers of the ocean. Um, now the organisms themselves were called or are known as fractal organisms. Um, 
And this is because they grew by fractal or modular construction. Um, their bodies were flat and anchored to the seafloor um, in complete darkness. They had no mouth or sensory structures, and they were very simple per se, um, as far as uh, obtaining nutrients. They just simply absorbed nutrients through their thin, flat bodies. Um, the most common fossil of these fractal organisms that have been found is called um, carnea. That's this kind of plant looking organism here. Um, it appears all over the world in rock that is approximately 560 million years old. Um, it was more of a, a deep underwater uh, species. Um, there are also species like uh, this one here, Dix Dickinsonia, um, Kimberella, um, Virginia. A lot of these um, kind of ceased at the end of the Ediacaran, but you can see the beginning of um, some body plants and again, these multicellular life forms. Um, due to the fractal construction, um, these organisms weren't able to evolve into more complex life forms. So they were outcompeted by organisms um, that would eventually give rise to our um, ancestors. Um, so again, that, that fractal organism lifeline ceased at the end of the Proterozoic eon because they were unable to further develop into more complex life forms. So that's Proterozoic, right? Um, following the Proterozoic, so again, the Proterozoic is that last eon of the Precambrian super eon. Um, so moving out of um, that, uh, moving out of the Precambrian, um, and now moving into the more of your, your Cambrian um, or the uh, what's properly known as the Phanerozoic um, eon. That is comprised of the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and uh, Cenozoic um, time eras. So we'll start with the Paleozoic, kind of moving into that. Um, Paleozoic means time of ancient life. Um, again, this was when we had the true development of modern um, multicellular organisms and diversification of those life forms. Um, now, the Paleozoic era uh, lasted from 544 to about 245 million years ago. And it's divided into six different periods. There's the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian. And we'll go through each one. So start with the Cambrian. Um, Cambrian um, period is known because of the Cambrian explosion. That's what it's known for. So with the um, we're kind of following the, the increase or uptick of atmospheric um, oxygen um, at the end of the Proterozoic period. Um, you had the second um, developmental period or stage of multicellular life. And that period or that, that second developmental phase was when you had that extreme evolution um, and successful evolution of multicellular life. So the beginning of the Cambrian period is known as the Cambrian explosion. Um, and that's due to the rapid diversification of marine uh, species and organisms during that time. Um, so you had a huge expansion in the diversity of animal species. Um, it was also during that time where you had the evolution of all modern body plans. Um, now, each modern 
body plant was present, but there was only a, a few species that actually represented um, each of those body plants. Um, now over the next few million years, these organisms would begin to develop better mobility and um, again, start to arise into the first modern day um, animals. Um, they would also begin to evolve more specialized features like claws and teeth, uh, which enabled them to become more successful hunters. And then their prey would follow suit by developing better defensive structures like hardened shells. So you started seeing kind of this evolutionary arms race as far as the diversification and expansion of different traits and features um, with these organisms. So this is a nice little summary slide of what occurred. Um, during the Cambrian explosion, you had the evolution of the first chordates and vertebrates. Um, vertebrates evolved at least 530 million years ago during this period. Um, and it started with the first chordates. Um, so this is an organism known as um, the KA, and it was um, the first chordate um, to kind of exist, or is it thought to be the first chordate to exist, um, and was discovered in Fergus Shale. Now, this is not a vertebrate. Right, so um, you can't say that this was our direct predecessor because it likely was not. Um, it was, however, um, a representative member of the chordate group. Um, and it's from the chordate group that vertebrates arose. So this was, you can think of as the, the footstone for the evolution um, of vertebrates. Right? This was your first chordate. It was from chordates that the evolution that vertebrates arose and evolved from. Um, you also see kind of modern day body plan, right? So um, this species is more correctly uh, denoted as a cephalochordate. Um, cephalochordates, again, they they're chordates because they have your notochord and they also have a nerve uh, nerve cord which is almost like a, a spinal cord or a nerve track. Um, cephalo meaning they have a distinct head region. Um, so because of this notochord, they go th during um, embryonic development, they have the creation of a distinct head region and a distinct anal region or tail region um, with different structures kind of specialized in those regions and the specialization of sensory organ, uh, organs um, and structures within the head region. So this was the, the starting point for, for your vertebrates. It started with chordates, and after that, arising from the phylum chordata was the creation of vertebrates. Um, the first vertebrate was um, a conodont. Um, these were kind of these worm-shaped or eel-like large-eyed fishes. Um, they had uh, no hard skeleton, but they had a, a stiffened rod of cartilage that ran along the length of its back um, that served as this primordial um, vertebrae, and it also had these V-shaped blocks of muscles along its side. Um, it had a brain, it had tail fins. Um, it was kind of this um, continuously exposed oral cavity or open mouth species, um, and it had barbed hooks at the anterior end of their mouths that act as uh, kind of a filter feeding mechanism. Um, they were jawless, so they were um, the ancestors of, of your jawless fish uh, with lampreys kind of serving as a uh, sister group 
Um, they did have mineralized skeletal elements in their mouth and pharynx. Um, the internal skeleton was composed of cartilage. Um, and they kind of occupied more of the middle water column. They weren't really uh, bottom dwellers. So again, these were your first vertebrates. These are the kind of the filter feeding structures at the back of their pharynx. Um, and then this is looking at some of their um, cartilaginous skeletal elements um, that help to create the first um, or early primordial vertebral elements. Alrighty, so that's your Cambrian um, period. Following the Cambrian period was the Ordovician period. Um, this lasted almost for 45 million years, um, beginning around 488.3 million years ago and then ending uh, 443.7 million years ago. Um, during this period, the area north of the tropics was almost entirely um, open oceans or open water regions. Um, and most of the world's land was collecting in the south um, to form a, a supercontinent, Gondwana. Um, these land masses that came together to form Gondwana were, um, they included continents of present day Africa, South Africa, sorry, not South Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. Now, throughout this the Ordovician period, Gondwana drifted southwards um, and eventually settled on the South Pole, uh, which would come to create a, a mass cooling event. Um, in the north, um, the landmass that would eventually, um, far, far, far later in history, um, to would eventually become North America, um, that was combined into um, a supercontinent region that would eventually develop into uh, Laurentia. Um, and that area was separated from Gondwana by this um, narrow region called the um, Apetus Ocean. So that's this area here, the Apetus Ocean. Um, so that's kind of what's happen, happening uh, geologically at the start of the Ordovician. Um, during the Ordovician period, 